And so I don't know about you, uh, but I'm very excited to be going through uh, the book of John. I hope in these uh, four sessions or whatever it's been that you've uh, you fi found them uh, enriching and uh, strengthening for, for your faith. Gospel of John is just uh, amazing. And um, here we are, we find ourselves uh, coming back uh, to, uh, to the life of Jesus as he begins his, his ministry. And what have we seen uh, so far? We've seen some amazing truths. We've seen that Jesus is the eternal son. We've seen that he is the long-awaited Messiah. We've seen that he is the one who takes away uh, the sins of the world and calls us to repent and be baptised. And remember, and I'm going to keep coming back to this again and again, and it's up on our, our logo on the screen, the overarching aim of the Apostle John is that you might believe and that you might have life. And everything that we see as we follow through it chronologically is all pointing to that overarching theme. All of these signs and all of these people and all of these witnesses that John is recording is that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that in his name you might have life. He is the one who calls his disciples and has been calling them ever since for the last 2,000 odd years, calling disciples, calling people to follow him, to trust in him, to lay it all down and come and pick up their cross and follow Christ. And then we uh, find ourselves now, as we move on from that, uh, that time at that wedding in Cana, we find ourselves uh, looking in this, this, uh, in this section of John's Gospel. It's distinct to John's Gospel. And some scholars call this the Book of Signs. The Book of Signs. And it records uh, seven signs that John wants us to see. And they're all pointing towards, remember, John's overarching theme. And the first of those signs is what we looked at last week, the wedding at Cana. And they're covered in between chapters 2 to 12, these seven signs, all pointing towards God. A sign, remember last week, that showed us the, the glory of Christ. But also consider this, how, how this sign that we saw last week in this wedding showed us the, the nature of God. So we looked at that. We looked at how it shows us the nature of God. So for example, in Hebrews, it says that Jesus is the exact imprint of the image of God. It's a little bit like, or in fact, it was a reference to a coin, and as you'd pick up a, a coin and you'd look on it and you'd see the image of whoever it may be. So from where I come from, you see the image of the queen or now to be the king. Or back in those days, I, my wife's pulling a funny face because it's now the, a king and not, no longer a, our beloved queen. Well, get over it, guys. Come on. I, God, God, God live the king. I'm a, I love the king. So I prefer the king of kings, but I also love our king. All right. So I've lost my place now. So... The point is this, that when they, when they looked at this, this coin, whether it was Caesar, whoever it was, it was supposed to be a, a print. It was supposed to be um, a mark, the image of something. And when the writer to Hebrews says that, that Jesus has come, he is saying he is the imprintation, he is the exact representation of God. And so no longer do you have to wonder who God is, for I guess for, for, for so long people were wondering what God was like. Maybe for some people even here today, you're not quite sure who God is. He seems to be this obscure figure or maybe you have this picture of him with this big sort of white beard sitting on the clouds and little cherubim playing their harps around him. Listen, we don't need to guess. We can look to Jesus. We can look to the Gospels and see exactly what God is like because he is the Logos. He, is, he was with God. He is God. And he shows us what God is, is like. And it's wonderful then to, to come to the Gospel of John and see what he's like, see what moves his heart. And last week we saw just that, didn't we? We saw as he rocked up at this, at this wedding where this bride and the groom had run out of wine, maybe a great insult, maybe a great embarrassment in this obscure family wedding in the middle of nowhere, about to be embarrassed how Jesus shows us his compassion for people. A sign that points to his divine power, yes. Where he not only shows compassion, yes, but also how it showed us his ability to change situations. And so do you remember last week, we remembered how as he turns the water into wine, he can change any circumstance in, in our life. If we, like Mary, but turn to him and ask him to do so and plead with him. Now, what we've seen so far is just countless 
witnesses of people all pointing to that same truth, that Jesus changes lives. So I was interested to read in the papers this week or to see online uh, this fellow who's going to come up on the screen. Maybe some of you uh, have, have seen him up on the screen, Russell, Russell Brand. And he's going through an interesting journey at the moment. And I guess a lot of the tendency is amongst more conservative Christians to to knock him a little bit because he's not quite using the exclusive language that we might want him to towards Jesus. But wherever you're at, I think at the very, at the absolute minimum, for those of us that have been following his story, we must recognize that God is doing something in his life. And actually, did you know today he was baptized in the UK, I'm assuming, in the UK. He was baptized. And he said this, speaking of just how God changes lives. He says, I know a lot of people are sort of cynical about the increasing interest in Christianity and the return to God. But to me, it's obvious, he said. As meaning deteriorates in the modern world, as value systems and institutions crumble, all of us become increasingly aware that there is this eerily familiar awakening and beckoning figure speaking of Jesus, that we've known all of our lives within us and around us. And I found that interesting. And I think actually that's not an isolated incident because what we are seeing recurring again and again are people who have put their faith in this world system that is like, as Jesus said, building your life on sand. And they are recognising that it's falling apart and through it all they sense that actually the claims and and the words of Jesus do indeed bring life. And so uh, we we remember people like Russell uh, Brand and others who have made this commitment. I was thinking, well, I'm particularly praying for him because he's getting baptised in in the River Thames, which for those of you who've never visited London, is the colour of Pepsi Max, okay? And he said, when he's speaking of it, that his greatest fear is in fact being baptised into the River Thames and catching E. coli. So, <laughs> but the part about giving his life to, to Christ, he's really excited about. But hey, listen, this is just one example, and we can get off the screen now. This is just one example of people throughout Britain and throughout America and throughout Hawaii and throughout the world whose lives are being changed, whose emptiness is being turned to wine and to joy. And Jesus is a saviour, and that is the name that we proclaim from the rooftops. And this is our message that we have here today, that Christ changes lives. And I know you're awake, which is why you're going to say, Amen. Amen. Because it's true. Christ changes lives. So we've seen that so far, the witnesses. But now in today's reading, it takes a turn of pace, if you like, that Matt read to us a moment ago. We see now another side of God. So we've seen his compassion. We've seen his power to change things. But now, actually, we see Jesus cleansing the temple. And this is something that's covered by all the gospel accounts albeit they're probably two separate occasions. So once uh, one, one cleansing of the temple is happening at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So it was a three-year period from when he was 30 to 33. This seems to be John recording the first time it happened. And then the synoptics, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are covering it at the end of his ministry before his crucifixion. So what we're looking at now is, is John's account, and it's taking place, as the others did as well, during the, the first Passover, oh sorry, the Passover, and this is John's, which is, which is the first Passover of Jesus' three-year ministry. So let's move from Cana, from the wedding, via a pit stop to Capernaum, to Jerusalem, and, see, and say what we see from the text. And the first thing we notice, if you follow in with me, from verse 13, which if you don't have your, your Bibles open, which I would encourage you to look at in the first instance, up on this jumbo screen behind me, what do you notice, verse 13, is that it is the Passover, that's right. Now the Passover, of course, is the most special time when around uh, that time... Uh, of the year, our time of, of Easter, of, of Holy Week, the Jewish people remember how God delivered them from slavery through terrifying signs, including the death of Egypt's firstborn sons. But God's people, who were covered by the blood of the sacrificed lamb, the angel of death passes over them. And then Moses leads God people, God's people, the Israelites, through the Red Sea and eventually into the Promised Land, which they call Israel. 
And in case uh, you didn't know, this ongoing uh, dispute that we're seeing on our TVs uh, unfolding before us now is over this land and who it belongs to. And for me, uh, personally, uh, historically speaking, I don't think there's any argument that the, all the archaeological evidence points to Israel as having the oldest claim of, over this land. And we see, as we turn to our, our Bibles, as we hear the Bible story, which is what drives us and, and, and steers us, we see that this land was given to, to God as their inheritance. So this is taking place in the land of Israel. Uh, we see that they're remembering the Passover festival. And we see that it is at, in the heart of Israel. It's in Jerusalem, which is the capital. And then we especially notice that they are now, do you see? So they're in Israel. They're in the capital, the holy city, Jerusalem. Where is this taking place? Do you see it from your word? Have a look. That's right. It's taking place in the temple. And I don't think any of these factors are coincidental. In fact, what I think John is doing, I believe, is that he is setting out that at the most important festival, in the most important city in the whole of the world, in the most important place, which is the temple, in comes Jesus, into the very heart of it. I think John is showing us that. And in what some historians say, if you think to, uh, now to the festival that's taken place, that it would have been this jam-packed city. So some estimate, uh, estimate around a million people. If you look to Josephus, he came up with some crazy calculation and said there was something like over two, two million. So if you like, if you want to sort of average that out, but basically you've got a million odd people all gathered into this old ancient sort of city, which wouldn't have had any of the infrastructure that we have maybe in Honolulu or some other of our great big cities on the mainland. And if you've ever been to uh, Israel or the Middle East, as indeed uh, Amy and I have been, you'll know that as you walk into this place, even still to this day, there are just stalls everywhere. And this would have only have been amplified during the festival of Passover. I can remember one time when we went out into, uh, into um, over, into, uh, over, over the border into Bethlehem, there were just stalls everywhere. And there was just merch everywhere. And I'm convinced most of it probably came from some part in Asia or Etsy. But there was just stalls absolutely everywhere trying to flog things. So can you imagine and try and understand as Jesus is going into uh, this capital city and this biggest festival with, say, a million people all gathered there and all these vendors all selling their stuff from wherever in Asia or, Asia or from Etsy. Like, literally wasn't Etsy. Don't, don't quote me on that. Okay, don't, like, take the little bit out of my sermon and put it online saying he says it was all from Etsy. That's not true. Don't do that. That's nasty. Okay, but the point is, amidst all of this, this busyness, there was this sense of, of joy and excitement as people came flooding in to celebrate. But there was also this sense of expectation, expectation that God is going to send a messianic deliverer like Moses, but greater, to deliver them not from Egypt, but from the Romans. That's right. And again, John is painting the picture that all of this is important, this festival, this joy, this expectation, this city, everything that they're hoping for. And again, once again, he's saying, and Jesus is, is in the middle of it because he is the answer to it. Jesus is the central figure in it. He's painting this wonderful picture. He's building it all up for us. The city, the Passover, the temple, they all point towards Jesus, who is the once and forever Passover lamb. Now, a few notes about the temple. Uh, the magnificent temple, and I appreciate some of the guys here are going through their Bible reading plan, and you probably would have covered this a few weeks ago, about Solomon building the temple, right? And this magnificent temple, originally built by King Solomon back in 953 BC, just a sidetrack, if I may, uh, uh, when Amy and I went out to go and visit the Holy Land. Now, of course, none of this temple is still there today. It's been destroyed, it's been looted, it's been burnt down. There's nothing left there today of the actual temple. But actually, regarding the outer temple walls, these huge, great big walls, you can actually go there today. And you can see all the different periods of time. And even like if you go through some of the, the little back rooms, which uh, as they've set it up, only the guys are allowed to go into. So as you go into there, you can look down and you can see the original, these massive, great big original stones that were laid by during Solomon's time. 
just thinking, wow, this is amazing. This is awesome to be able to go there and see some of this come to life. But the original temple that was built by Solomon back in 953 BC has been destroyed by this time that we're reading about now. Now in between, it's been rebuilt by Nehemiah and Ezra. Many of you would be familiar with that story when Cyrus, uh, the Persian king who we studied in our series on Daniel, allowed them to go back. But it wasn't that great. So the original temple that Solomon built, amazing. And the one that we're going to look at now, amazing. But the one in between during the, the days of Nehemiah and Ezra, it, it was okay. It was a little bit like maybe for some of the dads here, you'll recognize what I'm talking about. You go down to the beach and your son or your child asks you to, to build a sandcastle. And you build them a little sandcastle and you think, yeah, that's quite good, that. And then you look over and you've got some smarty pants, some other dad who's built a sandcastle and it's about 50 times bigger than yours and a lot better and you're thinking, well, yeah, okay. Right. So this is a little bit what it's like, this sort of interregnum, this sort of middle temple. It, it, was, it was great. It was good that they were able to go back and worship again in the temple, but it was nothing like what Solomon's temple was. Nothing like it at all. But enter uh, King Herod. And King Herod the Great, as he was called, although he was uh, short, a couple, short, a couple of sandwiches short of a picnic, as we say in England, okay, he was an awful king. But according to the history books, he was a fantastic architect. And one of his major works, one of his best works, was rebuilding the, the temple or refurbishing it and making it bigger and better. And architecturally, it was marvellous. It was considered, in fact, one of the ancient wonders of the world. And Josephus, again, for example, to quote him, who was an eyewitness of the temple, he said that the exterior of the building lacked nothing that could astound either mind or eye. It was amazing to look at. And the nation of Israel, I'm sure, and the people of Israel loved it. I mean, most countries have a sense of pride over some of their biggest and best buildings, don't they? Look at the US of A, for, for example, the, the White House, DC, Empire State Building, Costco. Okay, all these great big buildings that you sort of marvel over. <laughs> and maybe that's just us Brits when we come out here and we go, whoa, look at this. It's nothing like our tiny little shops. The Jews were, were no different in that they had this sense of sort of national pride towards their, their temple. It was amazing to look at. But, but here is the point, brothers and sisters, church. Here is the point. The temple, as glorious as it was, as central as it was to the Jewish way of life, despite all of these things, had forgotten what, that it was supposed to be a place of worship. Had forgotten its, its purpose. And verse 14, as Jesus enters the temple of God, what does he find? And the answer is, Those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers, they were just sitting there. Why were they there? Well, it wasn't because there wasn't a legitimate need for it. It's first century Palestine, as it was called back then. It was required of every pilgrim to both bring a temple tax, which through the the money exchange they would swap out for, uh, for, for, for a silver coin that was demanded of Uh, by the religious leaders. So basically you take your hard-earned Benjamins, you take them down to the temple exchange court and they would swap it for the only type of coin that they would accept in the temple, okay, which was basically a a very uh, refined, pure type of silver coin. And it also was required of every pilgrim to not only bring the temple tax, but to bring an animal for a sacrifice for the Passover, which depending on what you could afford was either a bird or a beast. And you can imagine that as people travel from all around to come to Jerusalem, it was an inconvenience to bring an extra animal with you, right? Now, we've just got back from, from traveling to Seattle. It's hard enough to transport five uh, animals. Five kids, sorry. Five kids. If, I love you guys, and you know I love you. Okay. If you'd have told Amy and I, though, that we could just jump on a, on a first-class plane and meet the kids washed, fed, and watered, I would have bit your hand off. Okay, so there are just some things that are more convenient, and as was the case for these pilgrims. It was just more convenient than carrying all of these sacrificial animals with them to go down to the temple courts and exchange it or to buy it and have it taken care of when they, when they got here. Now, I've heard varying opinions on this. Some say that these money changers and animal vendors were exploiting that need. 
They were exploiting the fact that the people had to change their money and they wanted to, to buy their sacrifices, sacrificial approved animals there. And what they were actually doing were they were ripping people off in their need. I've heard some commentators say on this that they were adding a commission of 12%, which is nearly as much as I charge my children when I lend them money, okay, back to me. It was a bit like when you go to visit a tourist place and, you know, all the prices are just overinflated because they know tourism's coming in. So it was a little bit like that. It became a bit of a, a machine, say some scholars. In fact, some commentators say that behind all this money-making and corruption was the man himself, the high priest, who was... Called, so in the gospel accounts you see two high priests one's called uh, Annas and the other one is called anyone? Bible knowledge time Caiaphas, Caiaphas. and Annas is his father-in-law and he was, all, he was the preceding high priest okay? and so they said that all of this sort of corruption and money swindling that was going on was called the bazaars of Annas okay? it was Annas's bazaars because he was behind it all. Now, of course, that's speculative, and, but I'm sure there's some truth in that. When you turn on today's TV and you pick up the newspapers, we see it everywhere, don't we? People mugging off and fleecing God's church in this disgusting prosperity gospel that we see floating around everywhere. I've seen it. I've been a victim to it. You know, I can remember also when Amy and I were, were very young in our, in our marriage and, um, and in our desperation, our financial sort of turmoil, we remember turning on the TV once and seeing this one charlatan who was saying, if you just send in this money, whatever you have, we'll send you this green handkerchief which has been blessed or this miracle water and, and then all of your problems will, will go in. It sounds, of course, naive and stupid to many of us now, but that's the problem. A lot of these ministries, they prey on people in their vulnerability and all they're really doing is they're mugging off and fleecing the church of God to line their pockets. So it's not, it's not something that doesn't happen, is it? So maybe it was true. But whether that was their motivation, whether they were or whether they were not behind all of this money-making uh, money machine that was going on, I don't think there's any doubt that these sellers were providing a needed service. They were providing something that the, the pilgrims needed. The point is this, it shouldn't have been happening in the temple. Why? Because again, the temple was a place of worship. So over a period of time, what had happened is what belonged outside of the temple, that may have even been helpful to the temple, had gradually, out of convenience, crept its way into the place of of worship now into the outer courts that were meant for worship and prayer and it had instead became a place of commerce and Jesus seeing what had happened as he enters the temple was angry so as we consider the different characteristics and the different sides of God we've seen his compassion and his mercy and his grace and his love here's another aspect of God that you need to see that Jesus was angry with what he saw in fact, he makes a whip of cords to drive the animals out. I don't think there's much kudos in saying that he was using them to start beating people up. I think that's consistent with the, character, the, 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 the nature of Jesus. But certainly he used them to, to whip the animals and to drive, drive them out. And he turns the money changers' tables all, all, all over and kicks them out. Now, if you've got an OCD like me, this is a massive issue. Can you imagine if you were a money changer? In fact, let me give you an example. Have any of you played Monopoly? Show me your hands. Most of us play Monopoly. And some of us, maybe, as we get a little bit older, our OCD starts to increase alongside our grumpiness and our need for orderly and neat and recognisable. Maybe you're that type of person like me. When you play Monopoly, you like to line it all up, nice and tidy, nice and neat, all in order. Okay, this is maybe just a military thing as well. All in order and have it all stacked up, all colour-coded, all looking good. And then there's always someone, isn't there? when you're playing games, who when they get up, what do they do? They knock it all over all the time and you're inside, you're just going mad. I can imagine then that these money changers, as they had everything neat and tidy, they set everything up, that along comes Jesus, this 30-year-old man, who obscure figure, who they don't even know, he comes and he just picks up their tables and he throws it up everywhere and he's chasing out, literally, their oxen and their animals with a, a whip of cords. There is always someone, and that just so happens to be Jesus now, and he's doing it because he is angry 
at what he sees. You can imagine the outrage that this is causing. The scene is, is heated, it's spicy. Jesus is mad. The animals are running off. The money changers are mad, but only one of them had the right to be angry. Jesus. How many of us know today that the God of the Bible isn't just or only a God of love, but a God whose anger burns towards the wicked, who thunders against sin and injustice and mistreatment of the poor? You see, there are times when being angry is both a wrong and a sin, and there is times when it is not. Some of us are perhaps even today harbouring anger for all the wrong reasons, maybe towards a loved one or a work colleague or a neighbour, whatever it may be. But Jesus said, if we allow that anger, which might be justifiable in the first place, to turn to resentment and to turn to hate, if we hate a person, then we've actually murdered that person in our hearts. Followers of Christ have no business hating people and carrying resentment along in their hearts. That's something that we need to take to the cross. Christians forgive as Christ has forgiven us. But there are times when things so move us that we do justifiably become angry. For example, did you know that the number one killer in this world today of the human race is abortion? We might think of it in terms of wars or disasters, but it's actually abortion. And the Bible is clear. All life from conception is precious to God and we should be angry. We should be sickened by any law that seeks to harm the unborn. And it goes without saying that if you are pro-life, which Christians should be, that includes all of life. And so we should also be angry with what's going on with people that are alive and, and, and born into the world. We should be angry with things like domestic abuse and sex trafficking and injustice that plagues our society. These things should anger us. We should also be mad with the way in which Western governments are dismantling the traditional family home. With the recent trends we see where instead of protecting women, we allow men to compete in women's sports and changing female restrooms. These things should actually make us really quite angry, shouldn't they? We allow men to compete in women's sports and change the female restrooms, or how uh, we are portraying that, that uh, a good form of masculinity is in fact toxic. And the over-feminization and neutering of men that I think we see prevalent in our society today. You know what happens when you take a good, hard-working, manly man out of the picture? Societal decay and family breakdown. I've seen it firsthand again and again as a pastor. And these type of things should justifiably anger us. And I know many of us are angered by some of these social injustices that we see in our culture today. But let me ask you a question as we make it relevant to our text. Do you show the same concern and the same passion towards the church? Because that is actually what Jesus is angry about here. That the temple, God's house... His father's house was being used for something it was never intended to be. And verse 17 tells us, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now this is a psalm of David, Psalm 69, where David in his anguish is calling out to God to save him from his enemies that have hunted him down unjustly. Verse 60, chapter 69, verse 7 of the Psalms, David writes, For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal, your house, consumes me. And David is saying here, because my concern, because my passion, because my zeal for your name, Lord, and for your house, because my desire to see you glorified in your temple and your house and to be, it to be a place of worship where you are praised, but because I lift that up above everything else, even my family have disowned me. Even my, fam, even my friends have ridiculed me and I endure scorn and shame because that is central and the first thing in my life, the glory and the honour of your name. For zeal, your house consumes me. And remembering this, seeing this, Jesus, the greater David, and his zeal for his ha father's house as a place of worship, the disciples remember what, what is written. For Jesus coming into the temple, this is holy ground. It's a place for prayer. 
It's a place for worship, a place to bring your sacrifice to God. And verse 18, the Jews come along to him and say, Oi, oi, what's going on here then? Or put another way, who the heck do you think you are? What, what sign? That was my British thing, thank you. What the heck do you think is going on here? What sign will you show us for doing this? What is the meaning of what you're doing, Jesus, Joseph's son, carpenter from Nazareth? What do you think you're doing? And Jesus responds by saying, tear down this building. And in three days, I'll build it up again. And their response in verse 20 shows us that they clearly didn't have a clue what Jesus has meant. They're going, what? Don't you know it took 36 years for Herod to build this temple? And you say you're going to build it up in three days? And I think even the disciples didn't understand what Jesus meant at this time because John adds this little instructional comment, doesn't he? Helping us all out by saying that he was referring to his resurrection when three days later he would be raised to life. Brothers and sisters, Christ's body is the temple. The old temple has been made obsolete. His resurrected body is the sign, the temple, the tabernacle amongst us, Jesus' body. So, So as we think about closing, what do we see? What can I see from the text today, ask yourselves? What do you learn about Jesus? How can we become more like him? This is what we want. This is the chief aim of every Christian soldier, to become more like him. Remember again, John's ultimate aim is so that you might believe and that you might have life in his name. What can we learn from this? That we might grow in our walk with Christ and love him more and experience the life that he came to bring us. And I think the challenge here, as we aim for Jesus, as we desire Jesus, as we long to be like Jesus, is to zeal for the same things that he zeals over. Do you you see it? Namely, for the integrity here of God's house as a place of worship. Now, there is, of course, a truth in saying that the church isn't a building anymore. It's where God's people are. Amen. Yes, it's true that church isn't about a building. Church is by definition the gathered ones or the gathering of God's people. So whilst my prayer is that one day soon we will have a place of our own, and I know Willie and the setup team want a place of our own, so they're not doing this every, every morning on a Sunday and packing away every Sunday, so we pray for that. Maybe God might bless us and give us that, that we can open it up throughout the week and be a blessing to the community in which, which we've, we've been placed and we feel God has called us to. But I know ultimately, whether that's in a chapel or a business park or a movie theatre, what makes church is where God's people are gathered, by definition. It's where his people worship and pray, where the sacraments, which is baptism and Lord's Supper, are administered, and where his word is taught. So it doesn't matter where it's not an actual physical building, and thank God for that, because we meet in a a movie theatre with sticky floors and mouldy popcorn behind your seats, which I know at least my children have been eating. (laughs) So, So let's presuppose that when I say that you should and we should zeal for God's house as a place dedicated to prayer and worship, that it's not about a building. But follow it through, the logic. If if church is about you and not about a building, how do we apply that to our lives? Don't you see that it means that your zeal and our zeal, that we are zealous and we are a people dedicated to prayer and worship? In fact, fast forward to the Apostle Paul's teaching and what does he say? 1 Corinthians 6.19 Don't you realise that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and has been given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. And what I want us to see today is that the same Jesus that came to the very centre of Israel, to the very centre of Jerusalem, to the very centre of the temple, to the place of worship, comes to us in similar fashion, to the centre of your life, to see what he might find there. What you've allowed to creep in, to see what you've made more important, to see if you have in fact replaced prayer and worship with something else in your hearts. 
The message of this passage is that God abhors false worship. He's angry with it. He comes to drive it out. Think back to my nominal Christianity and how God pointed me to Isaiah 29 and my false sort of milky Christian sort of life that I was living, this pretense, and coming to Isaiah and reading where God said to his people, you draw near to me with your mouth, you pay honour and homage to me with your lips, but actually your hearts are far from me. So it's not about going through the religious routine. It's not just about coming to church on a Sunday. It's about where our hearts are before God. And as Jesus came to the temple, to the place of worship, to see what he would find there, and to drive out what shouldn't be there, I believe that in the same, same way today, that Christ comes to our hearts to see what he might find in it. Because they're supposed to be places of worship and prayer. But the reality is that we allow so much into our hearts to take precedent and become Lord of our hearts, don't we? Now, why do you think it is Brothers and sisters, if you allow me to have a slight pastor's rant, okay, I have nothing but love and respect for you. Why do you think it is that we meet each Sunday, for example? Why we set aside one day in the week, one day, the Lord's Day, is because, like the temple had done, we are so quick to deviate and to allow other influences to come in and for church or for, for what the Lord has asked of us to become less and less important, things that aren't necessarily bad, but they creep in to our hearts and they, and, and they begin to take root. And it saddens me how so many in the Western church so readily trivialise this Sunday gathering that the Lord has commanded us to, to not forsake. It's how the early church all the way up to modern times understood it. But now with so many options prevalent for us today, many are showing that they prefer other things over the Lord's Day. Part of what we do by coming together is, by, is, is to set aside one day and to recognise it's all about God and to worship Him. It's a selfless act whereby we encourage one another in the Gospel and stir one another up to take our faith out there. And if we as God's people do not prioritise this, what are we teaching future generations? Don't you know that before anything else, and church helps with this on our Sunday gathering, that God, what God wants is for you to, in your heart, centralise worship. So, okay, what am I going to do about it? Well, I think it starts by having an honest conversation between yourself and with God. What may have crept into our hearts may not be what we've read about here, but it may be other things that we've made idols in our hearts. It might not be about money, sex and rock and roll, uh, but for me at my stage as a 40 I can't even remember how old I am, 45 or whatever it is, 44. It, it might be actually that the thing that I've allowed into my heart, my intimate place of worship might be my children. Yeah? It might be my ambition. It might be comfort. But I can't let those things into my, the place of worship, that inner place of worship in my heart. I cannot let them be more important than God, anything. It cannot be shared with God because he comes in and wants to drive it out because it belongs, that place of worship, in my heart to, to him. And so in closing, I want to leave us with that challenge in, in nothing but love for my church family. As he comes to your heart today, tell me what does he see? What will he find in there in the, in the most sacred part of your heart what will he see in there what have you maybe through God's word you you recognize that you've allowed other things to creep in and be elevated to that place of worship that belongs to Christ alone I wonder if the Lord is revealing areas in your heart today remember Jesus comes to change your life to lead you in your life and to give you life so give it to Jesus today, whatever it may be, you recognise it. Turn to Christ. Put it to death and ask him for, and his Holy Spirit, for his help in doing that.